Well, good evening. We've now had our first class and as we're getting ready for our next session, you are now assigned to look at the book of Judges, the first five chapters, and the book of Exodus, the 15th chapter. Now, this may be, for many of you, a new venture. I dare say that probably the stories we're going to be looking at are not the kinds of stories you would be accustomed to, say, doing in your vacation Bible school. They're not exactly tender children's stories. Uh, as you read through some of these stories, you may be repulsed a bit by the blood and some of the language that's going on. But here's some things that you may want to think about as you're looking at. Remember what we have talked about in class already. Ask yourself, who is the prime character of the story? I think that will also help you. Remember that what most people often forget is that the Bible is not intended to be a book of moral stories. It's not asking us to behave in the same way that it talks about in the book of Judges. But, with all of that having been said, there's also some things going on in the story that may help you a bit. As you're reading through the story, sometimes you may be thinking, it sounds as if they're saying something, but they're not really saying it. Oftentimes, in the Hebrew scriptures especially, there's a lot of double entendre, that means double meaning. And sometimes, when you are scratching your head and thinking, is it really saying what I think it's trying to say? It might well be. There's some things here that are going on. You might call some of this gallows humor going on in the story. So, for example, as you're reading the Ehud story in chapter 3, there's what we might call not only gallows humor, but a little bathroom humor going on here. What do I mean by that? Well, when you look at the Ehud story, it may be helpful sometimes on occasion to look at the meaning of names. One way of doing this is you can simply do a Google search, but be careful because sometimes these Hebrew names have a variety of meanings, but this may help you out. You'll notice that in the story in chapter 3 in what could be called Ehud as the judge, the leader of Israel, in that particular story he sets about to making a double-edged sword. Now, it tells us in your text, in the translation we're using, that his sword is double-edged and a foot and a half long. Now, think about that for a minute. That's not very long. It's sort of a short sword. And the text continues to go on about the fact that he straps this one and a half foot two-edged sword to his right hip, and that he's left-handed. That should be a clue about something. My grandfather, who was born in 1892, was actually born left-handed. But as I can remember him telling me, he was forced by his parents to be right-handed. That wasn't uncommon. Tools, implements, and everything in most of the world up until the middle of the 20th century, in fact, the late 20th century, were really designed strictly for right-handed people. Warriors especially had to always be conscious of the fact that they had to have the sword or the spear and the shield in the proper hand. Shield in left hand and sword or spear or weapon in their right hand. That was an absolute necessity in order for armies to be able to move in formation. So consider now that this is a left-handed man. Then when you look up in some translations what the name Ehud means, you'll find it means son of the right hand. So the son of the right hand is himself left-handed. And then we hear about Moab's king, Eglon. These names are a little funny, but if you look up Eglon, it has a number of meanings. One of them can be heifer. The other can be calf, and I think that's exactly what's meant here. It's sort of a play on words. You notice that in the story, in the third chapter, it seems to go on and on about how fat Eglon is. He's a fat dude. And 
That should say something. It's sort of like saying he is the fat calf. So, with all of that in mind, you will read in the story how Eglon is in the company of Ehud after he sends everybody out of the room, out of the upper room. There's also a description of carved stones, which may be a way of saying that these were carved stone idols, as if somehow this is something very different in the court of Eglon. That is, they worship foreign gods, unlike the God of Israel. And yet Ehud now goes into the chamber where basically the throne room of Eglon and Ehud then, in the privacy, in a place without any guards present, thrusts that one and a half foot two-edged sword from his right hip, in other words, he draws it across him, and stabs Eglon in his stomach. And it describes that it went right through up to the hilt, which is sort of a way of saying as short as that sword was, it went right through him. And as you read a little bit, you'll begin to say, is it saying what I think it's saying? Yes. If you look at it carefully in the text, it's implying that his bowels came out. And after Ehud left and left Eglon on the floor with the sword sticking in the fat that keeps making a big deal about, Basically, to put it graphically, he bleeds out. But more than that, the stench is awful because his bowels have been cut out. So when the king's ministers come by and come near the room and the door being locked, they just assume that he's, well, sitting on the throne, figuratively. And so there's the bathroom humor. Sometimes these stories are written that way with a bit of gallows humor to make a point. They are being, uh, having a way of telling us and sharing with us that the enemies of Israel are often put down to shame. So don't miss the bathroom humor, don't miss the goriness, but also remember who the prime character in these stories are. Continue to dig at it and wrestle with the text. And one of the things we find when we look at the Hebrew scriptures is that sometimes we recognize when we think about it, well, this is not too much unlike our own world. The world is full of violence. In our class session, we will discuss uh, in our upcoming class session some of the geography of Israel and some of the reasons why it seems like in all of these books there is so much war and bloodshed. Is it any different from today? And yet, what the story seems to stress is despite the unfaithfulness of the people, despite the unfaithfulness of the Israelites, they are given a land of promise, and God continues to be the prime actor. So as you're reading through this, be patient with it. It's not too many chapters. And if you've never read anything like this before, again, be patient with it. If you have, it may only confirm in your mind what you may suspect, which is that the Bible does contain some rather graphic stories. Not children's stories, really very adult stories. One other thing I'll mention to you. There is the story of pioneers that were going across the country to resettle. And in the back of the wagon, the children were reading from the Bible, the one book that the family was carrying on the long trip across the Western Plain. And the parents sitting up in the front of the wagon kept hearing the descriptions that were being described. What the children were reading about was frankly very graphic sex, the sex act between a man and a woman. The parents were appalled to hear their children talking about such a thing and asked them what were they reading. When they realized that it was from the Bible, they were shocked. It was from, in fact, the Song of Songs, which is a book that never mentions God at all in the text, but is really a love poem. So the Bible is full of stories like that. But in the case of the Song of Songs, 
it is a story that speaks about the love which God has for us. As you go through the text, be patient. We'll talk about it in our class session. Good luck and look forward to seeing you again in our next session. Thank you.